Portable amp decks are all the rage these days. Remember when AudioQuest boasted having the best options? Those days are long gone, and while AudioQuest is still stuck in 2015, the rest of the world has moved forward. It seems you can easily find a portable DAC anywhere you live. Xduo, Ibasso, Monolith, Razer, Astronkern, Bear Dynamic, iFi, Apogee, Heides, Helm, Earman, Fio, Shandling, and Ear Studio are just an example of the brand name options you can hear about all the time. And don't even get me started on the off brand stuff. And now, Colorfly has yet one more option. Colorfly is an Asian audio company. I have yet to find their website. However, if you dig through the forums, you will find their name mentioned here and there. Colorfly is best known for their DAPs and have very limited distribution outside of Asia. Now, Colorfly has released their $90 portable DAC amp, which they call the CDA M1. Shenzhen Audio sent me the M1 for review. Shenzhen Audio is among a handful of dealers that specializes in chi-fi gear. If you're looking for the mundane and the exotic, Shenzhen Audio has you covered. Check them out if you get the itch. Now, let's talk about the M1. What's it got under its sleeves? The M1 has a list of features that we've come to expect from modern DACs. It supports DSD-512, all forms of high-resolution PCM, single-ended and balanced output, and plug-and-play compatibility. Colorfly say that they use a customized ESS chip, which they're calling the Colorfly Alpha DAC. Unfortunately, Colorfly doesn't say what DAC chip they're actually using. The company says that this DAC uses the processor out of their flagship DAP, the U8, for whatever that is supposed to be worth. Colorfly says that the M1 has independent circuits for the headphone outputs. The single ended is measured at 100 milliwatts at 32 ohms and the balanced is 200 milliwatts at 32 ohms. The M1 has an interesting feature where it lets you select the impedance based on your headphones. It can switch between low and high resistance. Unfortunately, Colorfly does not say what the M1 actually does when you select between the two options. For some strange reason, Colorfly says that the M1 is perfect for gaming. They say that you can easily hear footsteps during competitive gameplay, which is a rather unique claim from a DAC manufacturer. Let's dispense with this immediately. This is marketing nonsense. No DAC will elevate your gaming in the way that Colorfly suggests. If you want to hear details during your gameplay, just buy better headphones. Despite Colorfly's assertion that the M1 is perfect for gaming, the M1 does not work with the Nintendo Switch. That's too bad, since compatibility with the Switch would have made the M1 a more enticing proposition for some. As for build, the M1 has an aluminum housing. It's as long as a thumb drive and about as fat. The M1 comes with a detachable USB-C cable. The cable, I think, is well constructed. The M1 has two buttons on the side. The buttons control volume. However, these are directly related to the volume from your source device. When you click the buttons, the volume from your source increases or decreases. So, if you've got this DAC connected to your laptop, I think it'll just be easier to control volume through your keyboard. There's a tiny LED on the top. This indicates whether you're getting low or high impedance. Red and yellow are for PCM, and blue and purple are for DSD. The M1 has a balanced 4.4mm and a single-ended 3.5mm headphone output. Colorfly does not include an instruction manual and does not have a website as far as I'm aware. Consequently, you might be a little bit confused at first if the M1's LED does not change color based on the impedance of your headphones. You actually have to press the side buttons simultaneously to switch between the impedance. Unfortunately, when you do that, the volume changes as well. It would have been much better if Colorfly had implemented a dedicated button. Overall, the M1 has good build. It's a bit chunky, but seems robust. The feature set is quite good. The only thing the M1 is missing is MQA, but I'm sure plenty of people will not care. I've briefly read other reviews about the M1. I have rolled my eyes to comments about the M1 having amazing dynamics and bringing music to life. If that's the type of review you're waiting for, do not hold your breath. Go elsewhere. Here, I'm only interested in the overall performance and whether the M1 sounds different from the competition. To that end, I broke up the testing into two phases. 
Phase 1 involved just using the M1 extensively with all of my devices, including laptops, my desktop, Macs and PCs, Android and iOS. The vote was to determine if the M1 exhibited any connection issues with these devices and whether I heard any oddities during playback. Phase 2 involved comparing the M1 against the competition. To that end, I chose the Low 2 Paw S1, EcoZerta ITM03, and the Dragonfly Cobalt to compete against the M1. I plugged each device into the same PC, then used Voice Meter Banana to send signal to them at once. I used a passive AB switch connected to the single ended output of each device. I played tracks from Amazon Music HD and Cobus, and also my local files. I tried to volume match when necessary through Voice Meter. I used the Osseo Audio Hi X55, X60, Allo Audio S4X, and the Sennheiser HD700 during the testing phases. Finally, I tried a variety of headphones to determine how well the M1 could drive them. In addition to the headphones I just mentioned, I also tried the Bear Dynamic T1, Avatone Planar, and the Hi-Fi Mansandara. Now, let's talk about the results. My overall experience with the M1 was positive. I never encountered connectivity or driver problems. Windows, Mac, Android, and iOS immediately recognized the M1. All my audio playback software, including Cobus, Amazon Music, Nirvana, Chrome, and Music B, worked flawlessly with the M1. I never heard distortion or clipping while using the M1. I never heard dropouts during playback. I never experienced any odd coloration or inconsistencies with my audio. But I also did not hear anything euphoric or special through the M1. I never felt that the M1 made my music sound any different from any other DAX or that my headphones somehow performed better. The buttons on the side control master volume on your source device. I wish there was a built-in volume attenuator on the M1, but that's not what we get. Frankly, if you're using a laptop, it's easier to adjust volume through your keyboard or trackpad rather than fumbling around with the buttons on the M1. When I compared the M1 to the Paw S1, Zerda, and Cobalt, I wanted to know if I could hear any obvious differences. Switching back and forth from one competitor to the other, utilizing the same source, the same music, the same headphones, the same volume, I heard no audible differences between the M1 or the Paw S1 with its EQ turned off. The M1 and Cobalt also sounded alike. The Zerda appeared to have a slight difference in mids compared to the M1. I thought I heard the Zerda present a slightly gentler vocal sibilance in comparison, but if that is in fact true, then the difference is still very, very minor. I of course tried various headphones during these tests. My findings were consistent irrespective of which headphones or tracks I used. The M1, in summary, essentially sounds identical to the Cobalt and the Paw S1, and nearly identical to the Zerda. Let's briefly discuss the M1's power output. I don't think this device will struggle to power most typical headphones. I was even able to get my 600 ohm T1 loud, but I don't think the M1 is really intended for super high impedance headphones. For example, the T1 was clearer and presented greater detail when driven by an amp with a little bit more power than what the M1 can provide. On the other hand, the M1 had no trouble with the HD6XX, which is 300 ohms. And no, the M1 is not suitable for the Modhouse Argon. Don't bother. The M1 is capable of driving planar midnight headphones, but in my experience, all planars need upwards of 200 milliwatts, so it will depend on your particular planar drivers. I can also confirm that the LED on the M1 changes depending on the impedance of the headphones you use, assuming you press the buttons. Whether the light actually signifies an audible change from the M1 is a different matter. I don't think it makes an immediate, noticeable, or significant change. Honestly, the impedance switch seems more like a marketing gimmick than anything else. I don't know why it's even an issue, since any amp with under 1 ohm output impedance will pose no effect on headphones. Anyway, maybe the M1's impedance switching does work and maybe it doesn't. The real question is whether you will hear any difference. I don't think the feature is particularly noteworthy, but someone else might. If all you want is a simple amp deck for your mobile device or laptop, then you've got a lot of good options. You don't have to spend more than $50 to solve that concern. In fact, Eco's ITM01 is a nifty little amp deck that costs around 50 bucks, has USB-C connection, and three EQ presets. Now that most laptops and phones don't have headphone jacks, we have to resort to bumbling methods to use our headphones, or settle for Bluetooth. Yuck. Apple's boneheaded decision resulted in a domino effect that's created a market oversaturated by portable amp decks. 
but here we are again. The CDA M1 is a good device. It's neutral, it's transparent, it's reasonably powerful, it's well built, it's easy to connect and use. It's unfortunate that the M1 has a few issues, however. For example, the volume buttons are not as useful as you might think at first. They only control source volume. Maybe this might be useful if you connect it to a phone, but not so much when you connect it to a computer since it would just be a little bit easier to work off the computer to control volume. The M1 also isn't really a gaming deck. Come on. If the thing doesn't work with the Nintendo Switch, one of the most popular gaming consoles, then its usefulness is not quite as robust as Colorfly would have you believe. All that mumbo jumbo about the M1 being perfect for your gaming is marketing BS. Compared to the ITM03, Low 2 Paw S1, and the Cobalt, is the M1 anything different? Well, yes and no. The ITM03 has optical output if you need it. The S1 has over a dozen EQ presets. The Cobalt is, well, um, the Cobalt is, um, well, it's expensive and made by a company notorious for its deceitful practices. That's unique. The M1 is a perfectly good DAC with a perfectly good amp section. It won't knock you into the next room, and it won't suddenly open your music like a flower petal on the first day of spring. This brings us to value. At $90, the M1 makes a tough sell. What's the shining feature that no other device has? You could argue that it's got power, and that's true. It's not overwhelming, but it's certainly enough for a lot of applications. But that's it. Many alternatives below and above the M1's price tag support high resolution audio, just like the M1. Since the M1's volume buttons only affect source volume, you're not really getting something unique in that respect. The M1's impedance switching is eh, questionable. If the device has the ability to switch to a lower impedance, then why wouldn't Colorfly just implement the lower impedance and forget about the switching mechanism? To me, the M1 is really pushing the limit of value. If it were $70, I'd probably say it's worth a shot. But at $90, I'm not totally sold. If it worked with the Switch or had EQ capability, I think that would pretty much take care of my concerns. The marketing says that the M1 can be upgraded through firmware. Maybe firmware adjustments might bring Switch compatibility or EQ functionality. But since Colorfly does not have an easily discoverable website, where exactly are we supposed to get the firmware if one ever comes out? Anyway, it's your call. It's a good device with good features. It's not class-leading, but it is certainly competitive. But not for gaming.